it's not about just um, plotting a bunch of numbers. You're drawn to this thing because it looks cool, then you realize what it is, then you want to know where it came from, then you want to know how it works, and then you start asking questions about you. What does this tell me about me? What's happened is all this technology that has previously been siloed either in, either in business or in science, it's kind of bled out into culture, it bled out into our everyday lives. The reason it's such a hot topic right now, obviously, is because you know, we're drowning in it. We're drowning in data. If I'm living in a world where I've got this many Facebook friends and this many Twitter followers and I've got all these charts and graphs and I'm wearing a fucking Fitbit and whatever, acquiring the tools to kind of empower yourself to make sense of it is something that's really important, not just for artists, but for everybody. Our embrace of these technologies has like far outstripped our understanding of them, whether it's about online experiments or data or what the difference is between what the NSA does and what Google does or Facebook or OkCupid. Okay there aren't very many people in my position who are out there trying to like talk about it because it is there is anxiety and there is some taboo around it, I guess. In some ways, computer scientists are trying to create systems that will seduce us, that we will love so much, that we'll use every day, that we'll you know, constantly be swiping right or you know, checking things on our phones, and it will just become part of the fabric of everyday life. Whereas artists, I think, have this different imperative. They almost want to create shock, a sense of being distant from the technologies and devices that we use. <laughs> So we're doing an interesting study where we've been interviewing just over 30 artists around the US and Europe around how they're using data and computational platforms in their work. It's so interesting right now to see this emerge from really just like the last five or six years where suddenly we're seeing a whole lot of artists ask related questions around data, surveillance, identity, privacy, but also the way that our data is manipulated by large companies and trying to build artworks that actually cause us to confront those questions. To me, data art comes out of both fascination and frustration. I felt like I had this very, very powerful medium that wasn't being used in a more cultural, um, emotional way. Data visualization has this long history of being very academic or being something that experts use. It looks scientific or it looks official. What I was interested in was sort of like, well, I think it's a medium. I think it can be expressive and I think we can look at different kinds of data that is not government data or it's not business data. I got sort of signed up against my will to an online dating service by a bunch of friends of mine. And uh, I got really obsessed with the process of writing the profile. And I was like, gee, I wonder what it's like on other dating sites. And I wonder what it's like from a woman's perspective. Before I knew it, I joined 21 different online dating sites. as a straight man, a gay man, a straight woman, a gay woman in every zip code in America. And I downloaded everybody. So I downloaded 19 million people, about 20% of the adult population in the United States, to a hard drive and started analyzing it and decided to make my own census, where I replaced every city in the country, their name, with the word people use more in that city than anywhere else in the country, right? So New York City's number one word is now, as in now I'm working as a waiter. You know, San Francisco's gay, Los Angeles is acting. I grew up somewhere between annoying and cynical in New Jersey, which I think is pretty good. Uh, I live somewhere between unconditional and midsummer in Manhattan. I can go down to the zip code level. And the idea was, what if we could refashion our political discourse, not about how much money we make, or our ethnicity and race, or our first language at home, or what kind of industry we work in, or how many people live in our home. What if we could refactor our political discourse based on like, you know, what we want to do on a Friday night, you know, or who we want to fall in love with. Okay, Cupid sets up maybe like 30,000 dates a day, something like that. We were one of the first sites to really like publish anything about what was going on. On, on our website. I mean, this is 2009, and so, but then Facebook was already popular. There was this kind of ominous feeling of like, oh, I mean, these sites are collecting all this shit about us. So we just started writing about how people of different races interact on OkCupid, or how people, men and women, rate each other on OkCupid. I mean, the more time you spend with all of the data that people generate, 
almost by definition, the more it confirms your like cynical intuition about people, just because it is the real data of people living out their lives. When you can put numbers to things that people have only had intuition about previously, you know, so you can get a kind of specificity or a clarity in talking about it that can be refreshing. There's lots and lots of stories to be found in a complex, rich data set. What you're doing is making little tools, implementing, if you will, little algorithms that are asking questions on your behalf, coming back with an answer, whether it's a visual answer or a numerical summary, um, and then you dip back in because it, it'll lead you to ask another question and then you just keep going um, until you feel like you found the story, you found something interesting. How do you show somebody something where they see that whole thing at once and it's both familiar and new? It's like when you are in an airplane and you're taking off from your hometown and you see you know, the cities laid out below you. It's such a revelation when, when you see everything going from like individual pieces that you recognize knitting together into a whole. The wind map is a real-time visualization of wind across the U.S. It's interactive also, so you can start zooming in. We have a gallery of different days, so you can just very briefly get a sense of how much it changes. And then you have really memorable days, like Hurricane Sandy. You just get a sense of the power of these storms. The fact that we have a map that is updating in real time showing that hurricane making landfall, it becomes incredibly emotionally powerful. I mean, I look at it, I'm scared. And we get email from other people saying similar things. And there, it's not just the pure image, it's not just the data, it's the context that this is happening right now in real time. Some artworks are simply about sort of marveling that these data exist at all. And so you often see data artworks playing with notions of the sublime, trying to give you access to large scale data, seeing something larger than yourself. Whereas I think often data visualization in the sciences does just the opposite, it tries to render it at a human scale to make it understandable to the individual scientist or something like that. When you remove the need for instrumentality, there's a kind of expressiveness maybe that comes up. The epitome of one pole of the data conversation, which is we need to be scientific and objective and rigorous and rigid about everything. And it's not what data are. They're human and they're messy and they're the results of the human measurement. And they carry bias and error and they carry stories and they carry tragedy and beauty and all of these things. They're a record of us in some ways. We so often tend to sort of get in some ways, I think, mystified by the sense of data as being something external to human perception. We're being told that big data is better because it's somehow more objective. It's this enormous data set, therefore it can show us the world in a way that is inherently more accurate than any other way. I think we have to question that. And I think artists are extremely good at questioning those kind of ideological assumptions. I did this piece called Hard Data. That's it string quartet. The music is a casualty stream of the Iraq war. So there's a movement for all the dead civilian men and all the dead children and all the dead women and all the dead soldiers um, and all the people who've been made refugees and all the people who've gone missing. And there's a measure a day. So 20 people got killed that day. The string quartet has to play 20 notes, right? So the arc of the music follows the arc of the conflict. Music's actually a really good medium to work with that problem of emotional resonance of data because you know all music really is is emotional manipulation of data if you think about it point blank all those chords and keys and whatever are data and what we're doing is we're trying to make you cry or we're trying to make you fall in love or we're trying to make you want to dance or we're trying to make you pray the Iraq war was the first conflict in which most Americans had more data than knowledge, right? More of us knew the numbers of the war than actually knew anybody who was fighting in it, right? And that's kind of a heartbreaking setup for a whole bunch of anesthetization with facts, right? We make ourselves feel better by thinking we know the numbers.
What we're looking for a lot in data is pattern. When you find pattern, and that pattern appears visually, something goes off in your brain. And one of the ways that that gets translated is, that's beautiful. These are aesthetic experiences, I think, of beauty and of strangeness. And so for me, I think the thing that unites all of the things that the artist said to us was this idea of the uncanny, something that is, was once familiar becoming strange. And we always stood ready to help each other out in different, different ways. Paths for America. America. A choice between, between the board. two fundamentally two different, different visions world every night for the future. future. When the dust settles on the 21st century, the biggest cultural artifacts that we will have left behind will probably be databases. So what are the things that we're leaving behind? How can you reconstruct what this culture was like? And what were the questions in this culture? And what was the experience of being somebody in this culture like? I think we are co-creating our futures with the platforms and tools that we use every day. So in many ways, we are changing what it means to be human. And that is a very significant step, but it happens over a long period of time. So we're seeing only a very small slice of what I think is going to be a very big shift in terms of how we start thinking about and using data.